Ah, thank you. <clears throat> and good morning. So drawing on the words of Holly Near's song, which tries to remind us that we can be angry and loving and gentle and peaceful all at the same time. Those are not mutually exclusive possibilities. She wrote this, of course, with many kinds of justice efforts in mind over the decades. So in a moment, after we uh, silence our cell phones and so we have maximum peacefulness today, I'll invite us in a moment to say hello as we do so many Sundays. This morning, I invite you to take a moment to, to think about if you were to name something of what you're feeling today, what might it be? Is it, is it, well, I'll invite you to share with each other in a moment. Will it be, will it be anger? Will it be joy, hopefulness? Will it be something else? So as you, as you say hello to the people around you and make sure that everyone is greeted well, feel free to share and or to ask, is there something you're feeling today? And you don't need to share that. That's up to you. You, you have the option. So hello and uh, what's, what, what are you feeling today? We acknowledge that we are residents or visitors on land that was never ceded, never given up by the Nisenan people, who are still among us here despite fraudulent removal of their federal tribal recognition. We seek to help correct their erasure and exclusion from California history and to support their efforts to stabilize their people. We celebrate with them the upwelling of community support as they seek to purchase some of their ancestral homelands, and we encourage all to support this venture. The lighting of the chalice. Come one, come all. Come with your missing pieces and your extra screws. <laughs> come, come with your hard edges and your soft spots. Come with your bowed heads and upright spines. Come all you flamboyant and drab, verbose and quiet, fidgeting and lethargic. All you with large vision and tender hearts. All you with small courage and tender fears. Bring your lisp and your stutter and your song. Bring your gravel and your drawl and your lilt. Bring your anger and your joy and your righteous indignation misfits and conformists and everyone in between come into this space and be welcome bring who you are bring where you've traveled bring what you long for and let us worship together in other words let us tune our hearts to what matters most Liana beautifully offered, thank you, the words of Ian Riddell. I invite us to sing our young ones on their way, at the very least in spirit, <laughs> with, with, the light, with the light that goes with them from the light we share in this room together, this little light of mine.
Good morning. Good morning. I am Lindsay Dunkel, and I am serving as worship associate for this morning's service. Welcome to those in the room and those on Zoom, to the Unitarian Universalist Community of the Mountains, a place where we are each welcome to bring our whole selves, all the wild woolly bits, the boring bits, the prickly bits, the joyful bits, the grieving bits, the conflicting bits, all of it. May you be able to lay your burdens down for this hour of worship while we set aside time to make sense of ourselves and the world. We strive to make of this place an to make of this a place of authenticity where we can seek solace, feel a connection to others, and stretch along our growing edges, building together a beloved community. Come, as we heard in our chalice lighting words, let us tune our hearts to what matters most. And our opening words this morning will be sung by the choir. joy. 
What a pleasure. And Jordan's in the house. Jordan Thomas Rose. For, 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 those who, for those who don't know, Jordan was the music director here uh, before Toby. So. No relation. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <clears throat> So I was thinking with joys and sorrows when I was uh, young and uh, growing up in the Catholic Church. So we, we had, you know, banks of votive candles, sometimes the smaller votive candles, sometimes the seven day candles. And very often people would come in and light those candles, sometimes before or after a, a mass, but also all week long people would come in. And it was not uncommon, especially in more urban areas, for people who were not Catholic to come in and light a candle. There's something about the tangibleness of that ritual, the idea that this flame is holding vigil for whatever people were carrying. Most often what they were worried about, but sometimes what they were glad about too. Our ritual this morning is a variation on that theme. It's a variation on lighting that votive candle. I think of it as a very California friendly version of lighting candles, <laughs> especially in the summer. We place a stone invite you to place a stone in a bowl of water. And for those who are online, we've initiated an equivalent, which is to type a zero or an O, a stone-like figure in the chat, or in the chat to name some of what you're carrying. I invite us to search our hearts in the music and the quiet and to hold each other. In other words, this is not nothing happening. There's something very important happening during this time, even if we're silent. And I invite us to share that bowl and that table. In other words, to come up multiple people at a time, to remind ourselves that we're in community. So I invite you to look inside, take note, acknowledge what's in you today. Maybe you named a feeling already, or maybe there's something else that's coming up. I invite, invite you to lift up your prayer in the silence, if that is your practice, to center your mind, if that is your practice, and regardless, to hold each other in a great deal of tender care as we mark this moment. I have placed stones for all the rest, including for those folks who didn't feel comfortable coming forward and placing a stone or who could not, for the folks who are on Zoom as well. For our meditation, our prayer this morning, I invite us first to hear the choir and then to sing. A prayer that was written by Samir Badri, a Muslim gentleman who invited Ted Warmbrand, a Jewish gentleman, to write music for his words. This was after they had met in a peace rally in Arizona after 9-11. We'll be singing actually the Arabic. Dauna Naish. Be Salam. Dauna Naish Be Aman. Dauna Nan Siege. Achlam. Dauna namut, be salam. Let us live in peace. Let us live in inner peace. Let us weave our dreams together. Let us die in peace. 
Whatever it is you're carrying this morning, I invite you to first receive and then to join in this prayer for peace inside and out.
aspect in the Enneagram. <laughs> the final personality aspect in our year-long series. The nine is known as the peacemaker, or I think the most wonderfully apt title is the peaceful accommodator. <laughs> Those who know nines are <laughs> yeah, chuckling at this. This is the easygoing, reassuring, agreeable, or accommodating part of us that goes with the flow and gets along with just about everybody. Generally quiet, self-effacing, receptive, the part of us that is deeply afraid of conflict and that is inclined to go along to get along, to not rock the boat and to not want our boat rocked by anyone else, thank you. This is the part of us devoted to seeking peace inside and outside in our families, our communities, our world. The part of us driven always to calm the waters. The part of us that wants everyone to get what they want and for everyone to just get along. And so not to disturb our peace. The part of us that sees much more than we say. People in whom nineness is primary are often strong mediators, bridge builders, soothers who exude ease and calmness. I can't tell you many times I've been to a conference or a class and I've met people, I don't know people at all. We've been in class, I don't know, for an hour. I've hardly said anything. And they'll come up later and say, I feel so calm around you. <laughs> but that calmness comes for our nineness at a personal price. All year I've been approaching the Enneagram with the understanding that we each have all nine aspects in us to varying degrees, all nine sets of gifts and all nine sets of challenges and fears, those fears that drive our behavior. And though one personality aspect is usually primary for each of us, we are, none of us are simply one thing. The nine is the type that embodies this most completely. Nines including yours truly, identify with all the types. We can see ourselves in all of them, which allows us to see things from many different perspectives and allows us to understand many different kinds of people. It also makes us appear wishy-washy sometimes because we can see something this way and we can see it that way and that way and that way and that way and that way. The thing is, Nines identify with all the types, except nine. <laughs> we have this powerful glimpse into everyone except ourselves. We know who everyone else is, but we have a hard time knowing who we are. And in this, nines are the poster child for all of the ways any of us falls asleep to who we really are. Every one of the nine Enneagram types we've been talking about this year describes a particular way we learned early in life to protect ourselves and to get something we really needed by putting on certain ways of thinking and feeling and seeing and acting. And we become so used to wearing those ways, so used to that particular personality we've kind of put on that we forget those vital parts of who we are underneath all those layers. So why do nines do this so very completely? What the nine in us wants most is to feel deeply connected. That's what we want more than anything, to feel deeply connected. And so what the nine in us is most afraid of is disconnection, of separation from those that matter to us. And so what the nine in us learned early on is that when we know who we are and what we want and we express that and reach for it, we will inevitably sometimes be at odds with what someone else wants or needs or expects or is willing or able to offer us. And we learn that that tension or that gap causes the key people in our life to withdraw or lash out sometimes, or otherwise break or not offer the connection that we so want to feel. So we learned not to risk disconnection. 
We learn not to risk it. We learn to keep the harmony and the peace by disappearing in essence, by, by blending into the background, often in terms of clothing. All my life I've worn very muted clothing. It sort of blends in. So this is my, this is my antidote shirt, right? <laughs> We learn not to cause trouble. We learn to be low maintenance by having simple needs, by staying inside our cozy mental or our physical cocoon. All oh, we nines like our cozy home spaces. We learn to keep everyone else calm so we can be calm. We learn to not assert ourselves and our wants and our needs. And we learn not to take action because that might create conflict. And we follow other people's agendas, not having our own. And we learn, certainly, not to express any anger. So much so in all of this that we truly forget that we even have any wants or needs or desires or anger of our own. It's not that we even deny it. We don't even know we've got them. And at our unaware surface, we become content with whatever is in front of us, whoever is in front of us, with whatever others want. It's all good. Generally, it feels, oh, that's fine. We easily serve other people's needs and agendas, and we wait for life to come to us. The stereotype, of course, but true. The classic scenario that's used to talk about nineness is any kind of conversation about what to do for the evening, or for example, which restaurant to visit. If you ask a nine, where do you want to eat? The ready answer is, I don't know, where do you want to eat? Class, I can't, my poor partners, I can't believe how many times <laughs> I said that, something like that. Actually, the whole range of eating options feels genuinely open. Like I could be good with all of those until a decision is, a decision is made to go have sushi. <laughs> and then the nine in us realizes that oh, I don't really want sushi after all, <laughs> which we will only say out loud if we've learned to risk it with someone we trust. But more likely, we'll just quietly feel miffed. <laughs> both that we're going for sushi and that we're not saying anything about not wanting to go for sushi, both, we're miffed at ourselves. And so we'll be unconsciously passive aggressive, going along, but not acting all that happy about it all evening. The nineness in us has a tendency to say yes before we even are aware that there's a more real no underneath. In fact, the nine in us is often more clear about what we don't want than what we do want. And that's one of the tools for starting to discover who we are by identifying what we don't want in order to get some idea of what's left, which helps us know, oh, that's actually what I want. It's a process of elimination. Nine is the type also that's most anchored in the body, which surprises some people, usually without knowing it. We're, we don't know that. And that's another tool for self-discovery then, listening to what our body's telling us about what we're thinking and feeling. Our guts are, have this very strong sense of what's going on. Our minds might not get it, but our bodies don't forget who we are. And they will tell us, right? That aching gut, that flutter, the anxiety, whatever that is, we'll feel it in our bodies. And anger turns out to be the driving emotion for nines the thing we don't think we have, right? That's why it drives us, right? It's invisible, we've buried it. We're sometimes described as dormant volcanoes. <laughs> it's all under there, but boy, we're not gonna let it out until we can't help it, and then watch out. Healthy nines, uh, when, we, when we're not healthy, we don't allow ourselves to even realize we've got that anger in us because anger would lead to disconnection, certainly, right? So as with every type, the nines fall into a particular trap. By not acknowledging and working with our anger or our fear of conflict, by not realizing what we want, by wanting everything to be calm and peaceful all the time, we risk always allowing things to fester and become problematic and to get even bigger and worse until they're more of a problem. There's, there's no escape. Until there's no escape and things blow up or fall apart. And in that process of doing that, we miss out on the learning that addressing conflict and anger when they're small, not only staves off more anger and conflict, but it also prevents us having a real relationship, right? We're trying to preserve the relationship. That's what we most want. 
But in trying to do it this way and not addressing what really needs to get addressed, we're actually missing out on the real true relationship. We have to be real to do that. It's very difficult for nines to wake up to who they are because that will not be comfortable. That will not be peaceful. And it's going to come with a whole lot of grief. As Sleeping at Last puts it in a song they wrote uh, for and about nines, I've been less than half myself for more than half my life. I've been less than half myself for more than half my life. And that's a painful realization. Nine or no, it may resonate with you. Nines have the gifts of very profound patience, quiet strength, a deep ability and willingness to let others be who they are and to develop in their own way. The genuine ability to cultivate harmony and getting along. Getting along. At their healthiest, nines are emotionally stable, serene, optimistic, supportive, resilient, open, unpretentious. Okay, all you nines and nine lovers and nine knowers, what else would you say about nines? What else is there to say about nines or nines? I'm sorry? An empty, An empty bucket list. I don't know what I want, so the bucket list is empty. Annoying. Annoying. <laughs> Right? On the one side, we seem so easy to get along with, but boy, you get to, right, we can be really annoying. Repressed. Repressed, right? All the stuff that's in there has nowhere to go. Chameleon. Chameleon, blend in, right? We, we know all the types. We can blend in all kinds of places. Afraid. Afraid, yeah, there's the fear. Some famous nines, ostensibly. Abraham Lincoln. Queen Elizabeth II, Janet Jackson, Norman Rockwell, Walter Cronkite, Carl Jung, Morgan Freeman. Oh, there's a nine voice. Gloria Steinem, Whoopi Goldberg, Walt Disney, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Audrey Hepburn, Alicia Keys, Barack Obama. Groot. Groot from the Marvel. Harry Potter under the staircase, right? And Bruce Banner, AKA the Incredible Hulk, right? <laughs> Mild-mannered until, until. <laughs> so what, what do you expect are the, are the country, or this country or the countries that embody nineness? Sweden, perhaps? Switzerland, Switzerland neutral. We're not gonna get involved. Oh, Canada. Canada, nice, Canada nice, right? Pre-industrial countries, yes. The other one that's named sometime is Jamaica. It's all good, right? The stereotype of it's all good. It's all good. Animal? Animal that embodies nineness? Chameleon. Dog? A Labrador? <laughs> Golden Retriever? Sloth. Sloth, right, right. So, so... The idea of uh, laziness is attributed to nines, not laziness in getting things done or act action, but laziness in discovering who we are, right? That we're, we're just going to let that be. We're not going to really risk that. Elephants are named sometimes, right? Quiet, plodding, doing their thing until, <laughs> until. Well, I'm very pleased to say that Lindsay has some reflection to offer on nineness. I don't know. I feel so exposed. <laughs> I, I feel like I have to tell you that my children, when they were teenagers, looked at me and they said, you know, whenever we asked you if you were mad, you would always say, no, I'm not mad. I'm just frustrated. <laughs> So when my husband and I first bought our house, I, I suddenly understood with great clarity that owning a house meant a lifetime of projects. That loose step, the crack in the tile, the water heater that needs draining, the trees that need trimming. And at the ripe old age of 58, I've come to understand with great clarity 
that being a human is the same. A lifetime of projects. <laughs> we're never done, it seems to me. We never arrive. If we're lucky, we are always becoming. And, and I don't mean this in the vein of often toxic self-improvement slash self-help mania that seems to have overtaken American popular culture, that we must be constantly getting better at everything and never waste a minute of our lives. We are always becoming in the sense that we continue to learn who we are, both by nature and nurture, why we act and react the ways that we do, what we truly want and need, what we're capable of, how we can contribute, what we carry, what we can set down. In preparing uh, what I was going to say this week, I was looking back through some poetry and I found a poem that I wrote many, many years ago that speaks of this unfurling, the many aspects of self as understood both internally and as applied externally. And I was rereading it this week and I saw for the first time how it reflects my nineness. It has references to an easy child, to having to learn to express anger and negative emotions. It has references to being lost in thought. The I'm not that big a deal reference, the defined by others sections. And I love how at the end, it's like a dream or a playful aspiration of transcending all of that, a dream of integration in the language of the Enneagram. So here it is, naming. As a child, I was called sunshine or long drink of water. Yesterday, my name was storm cloud, prickly pear. It took so long to learn. I've called myself inspiration and maybe one or two others have too. One day I'll be known as tiger tail, stripes and all. When I die, they'll speak of me as mountain, river, or blue whale, though I'll not have been that big. My cats know me as giver of raw chicken. My baby called me mmm, mmm, but now it's more like plaything, picker upper, comfort giver, and mustn't forget jungle gym. My teachers called me quiet one, thinker, and who? <laughs> Sometimes I'm called shadow drifter, lost in thought, feline. I don't often use my claws. When they write it in the sky out over the ocean so people lying on the beach can see it, then my name will be Aqua Blue Zambu, and I will smile when I see it floating up there and dive straight through the waves. I like to think that someday I'll get to Aqua, Zoo, Aqua Blue Zambu, maybe. I had a powerful experience in my early 20s of seeing an old home movie. And at the time I was in therapy and digging deep for my authentic self as opposed to my what others need of me self. And in this snippet of movie, the camera panned away from fun family pandemonium by a swimming pool to two-year-old me sitting in the shade under a tree, calm and happy, taking off first one shoe and sock, and then the other, playing with my toes, stopping to dig in the dirt now and then with a stick, probably singing to myself. I had a visceral reaction to that scene. That's me. That's who I am. And I can tap into that grounded, content person when I need to. This becoming, it seems to me, is also a return. As I evolve, I am also working to get back there, to that Lindsay. So maybe one day I'll get to Aqua Blue Zambu. But uh, for now, I am Lindsay, and I am decidedly a work in progress. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. We are works in progress, indeed. During sabbatical renewal last year, I dove into studying the Enneagram, 
and it, into some great therapy as well, in part because uh, something inside me was crying out to be liberated at last after 60 years, and in part to put on my own oxygen mask in order to be of greater service to you and to this community. The type nine qualities that this congregation was looking for when you called a minister eight years ago, the calming, soothing, harmonizing, peace-seeking minister you sought in a difficult time, <laughs> qualities that have served well in certain ways through national political upheaval starting in 2016 and a worldwide pandemic since then, all of that needs to be complemented in order to move forward by a minister's clear sense of self, a willingness to learn to engage conflict well and constructively, a minister able to know their own wants and needs and to reach for them, even when that risks people's displeasure and disconnection at the surface anyway. The ability to take and hold a clear stance even when it's not popular or might not be. I undertook this series of Enneagram services this year to help me further my own journey, yes, but I have also hoped that these services are inviting you into curiosity, into greater awareness of yourself and others and all the many aspects and layers of each of us. Some of you have grooved on these services and are seeking deeper engagement with the Enneagram's insights. And others, others of you have been, eh, I don't really get it, but okay. So thanks for your patience and the space you've allowed. It is bearing fruit. In April, I was hiking in Ashland. This is after a couple hours of hiking, thinking about a comment for some reason in a recent podcast, some variation on the idea that everyone has a purpose in life to discover. The thing is, I don't ascribe to that notion that there's some singular purpose we're each supposed to discover. I believe we find and create purpose and we'll look back and see purpose and that there are many possibilities for each of us. So I don't think there's one particular purpose we're supposed to find. But I started to wonder to myself whether believing that is helpful for humanity, even if it's not true. In other words, does it ultimately do more good to live as if each of us has a purpose for us to find? So in the midst of that thought, I suddenly had this sense of a wave, including that thought about needing to find purpose, a wave coming from out of the sky and washing over and through me, kind of with that kind of force. And with it, I felt the heavy weight of a lifetime, a lifetime of shoulds and oughts and do's and don'ts and not following my own needs and intuitions. Things I've been carrying and that have essentially tethered me in place is what it felt like. And with that realization, with this wave, I had this sense in that moment of being encased in like eight to 10 inches of thick, heavy, crusty, wet flesh. You know, like a kid's snowsuit that restricts your movement, only much thicker and heavier and deadening and immobilizing. And I had this urge to peel this encasement back, to peel it off. And so I did. Without thinking too hard, I, with my hands, I'd made this motion with the sense of breaking the surface and peeling the thick layers back and off. And what I sensed remaining underneath, exactly me-sized, skinny and slightly greenish for some reason, <laughs> was wet and slimy, kind of like the scenes in movies when aliens are being born. <laughs> like mammals too, including us, wet and gooey, with tender skin only because it hadn't been exposed for long, but not at all fragile. No, strong and energized. In fact, I felt luminous luminous, completely energized and free and limit, limitless, able to go anywhere, do anything, absolutely at home, anywhere and everywhere. The real me beneath all those layers, luminous. I shared this story with someone who afterward uh, wanted to know where I was getting my mushrooms. <laughs> Mushrooms. 
My intuitive and imaginative self has never needed mushrooms. <laughs> I live and breathe and feel in metaphors and images. It's a five-ish and a nine-ish way of experiencing truths and feelings through metaphors and images. I've thought and talked about this inner sense of health, self, as you know, for years. And though I've had a genuine awareness and sense of that true self inside, this was the first time, as an adult at least, that I experienced it so completely, so vividly, so directly. The first time I met that me, that luminous me, fully. Enneagram teachers refer to this true, unmitigated, uncompromised self as one's essence. That's our essence, they say. Other religious traditions have other names. The real, true you, by any name. The nine Enneagram types are each a different way we forget some important aspect of our essence. That's the teaching. The goal for all of us always is to wake up and remember who we are. And now that I've experienced that self, this self, this essence so profoundly, I am powerfully motivated to do what it takes to liberate it. Not knowing exactly what that means. And I call this me Luminous Kevin. <laughs> and I find myself asking, what would Luminous Kevin do? Which is, more, which is more than a simple intellectual exercise because I have a felt experience of that to anchor me as a point of reference. I can go back to it and feel it and say, oh, what would Luminous Kevin do? Quite honestly, encountering and being your Luminous self in your own way is my deep hope for you and my deep hope for us. We Unitarian Universalists are the children of two traditions, each born of their own strict Protestant Calvinist parents who did their best, traumatized as they were themselves. They born of our Catholic great-grandparents during the fertile and violent chaos of the Protestant Reformation. And they born of our Jewish great-great-grandparents, and they of our ancient, hard-scrabble, earth-centered great-great-great-grandparents. We have pieces of each of their DNA in this Unitarian Universalist tradition, but we also have our own true self, our essence to discover and realize. Individual congregations each have their own personality, their own type, but as a tradition, Overall, I think Unitarian Universalism is, in aspiration, a nine. Seeing from many perspectives, remaining open to many perspectives, wanting everyone to get what they want and need and to get along, wanting to be a harmonizing influence while also courageously clear about what we want, a relatively young tradition in search of its own true self, sometimes more clear about what it doesn't want than what it does want. In search of a true self beneath the heavy layers of whatever intergenerational shoulds and oughts remain, though so many layers appear to have been shed already. Healthy nines can have the strengths of eights the sense of fun and adventure of sevens, the dutifulness of sixes, the intellectualism of fives, the creativity of fours, the energy and attractiveness of threes, the generosity of twos, and the idealism of ones. They also know who they are in addition to all those things. They know their own gift for bridging and harmonizing, seeing many sides and seeking peace, and most of all, deep, deep connection. Although we might not be quite aware of that. The current drive to articulate anew what matters to us, Unitarian Universalist, the values proposed to take the place of the seven UU principles is a way to try to get beneath the layers 
to the essence of Unitarian Universalism. Interdependence, justice, transformation, generosity, equity, and that most perfectly nine-ish of values, pluralism, our theme for this month. For later, those pages on your chairs are reminding you that there'll be a vote coming up about whether to pursue these sets of values, all understanding love at the center. The thing is, words can never adequately hold or convey such things, ever. But they're what we have to work with across the wide swath of our tradition. Well, that words and metaphor. What would liberated, luminous Unitarian Universalism do we are being asked? What would liberated, luminous UUCM do? There's the question for this new day, this new moment in the world. What would luminous UUCM do and what could we do to meet it? And underneath it all, of course, the deep question, what would liberated, luminous you do? Maybe you know already, or maybe that's the journey of waking up that you're on. Whatever your types, whatever our types, oh, may we find that you return to that. May it and so much more be so. We take up an offering during our worship service to make a community expression of thanks for the blessing of abundance to visibly bring in the harvest at this most cherished hour of our week. Our offering says that the act of giving is essential to our spiritual well being as anything else we do here on Sunday mornings. The act of giving is an act of worship. And each week we extend that act to include a local nonprofit that reflects our values. 25% of our offering this month will support Care Crisis Nursery, whose mission is to provide shelter, respite, and assistance to families and to children and their families who are facing a crisis, and to safely and effectively supervise court ordered visitation for families seeking reunification. If you are in the room, and you would like 100% of your donation to go to Care Crisis Nursery, you may place it in the white envelope. And see the slide for more ways to give. The morning offering will now be given and received in the spirit of grateful fellowship.
Thank you for your generosity. We dedicate this morning's offering to that primary spiritual quest of self-understanding, which inevitably enables us to understand others, to experience the empathy and compassion that activate our desire for justice in our families, community, and the wider world. And thank you this morning. Thank you to Jordan and Toby for your music and to all of the choir members. Thank you so much. Wonderful music this morning. Thank you to Paul and Cypress back there on our audiovisual team, to Eileen for being our chat host, to Shanti for our gorgeous setting and our greeters, Jean and Corey. Refreshments this morning, thanks to Keith Johnson and Soul Matter Circle number one. <laughs> and, and to Jenny and Cheryl for being upstairs with our little ones. <laughs> so coming up this week, we have Citizens Climate Lobby on Monday and lots of the uh, pride family potluck this Friday evening all are welcome and all ages are welcome come join us for a potluck supper. A UU values retreat this Sunday this Saturday sorry RSVPs are helpful to UUGrassValley.org. spirituality sharing circle also on Saturday so many Saturday offerings this this week and a book reading with Ruth Gio and friends on Saturday at three. UU values uh, history and future, this time focusing on the future part it's next Sunday, May 26th, after the service. And our community business meeting, this is just a save the date, Sunday, June 2nd at 12.30. And it's time to select the Share the Plate recipients for next year. So vote after the service today and the next two weeks. It will become evident. <laughs> and as always, you can learn more about us at our wonderful website, uugrassvalley.org. <laughs> nice well, there, there's our hope and trust that it will become evident. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, truly, thank you. Thank you for today. For a closing song, we're going to sing Peace Like a River, right? Okay, very Nina's sentiment, but we're changing the order of the verses a bit. So for what we sing, we're going to end with peace. We're going to, we're going to go through joy and tears and pain and strength to finally get to really true, true peace. And Jordan's going to take us in. So we're going to listen to Jordan for the first verse, and then I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and to sing. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul, I've got peace like a river I've got peace like a river I've got peace like a river in my
our closing words, back to Ian Riddell's invitation. Bring who you are, all of who you are. Bring where you've traveled. Bring what you long for. Bring your true, awake, and luminous self. And moment by tender and courageous moment, let us keep tuning our varied hearts to what matters most. Until we meet to do that again together, let us carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Please join us for connecting and interacting and some food, and we'll see you next Sunday to bring your questions that the minister is going to maybe answer. Thank <laughs> you.